Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. My name is Marcin Undak and I'm working on the Stadia porting team here at Google. The goal of this talk is to explain how binary translation of Windows games to Linux work, so hopefully you'll get a better understanding of how technologies like Wine and Proton work. Let's dive into it. First, a little bit about myself. I've been working in the game industry for about 12 years now, mostly as an engine and porting programmer. Here you can see some games I've worked on in the past. Currently, I'm part of the porting team at Stadia, where we work on tools and technologies to ease porting efforts for developers bringing their games to Stadia. Let's start by reminding everyone what Stadia platform is built on top of. As you probably know by now, Stadia is a Linux-based platform using Vulkan and its rendering API. Even though I say Linux, it's actually a very custom system stripped out of regular desktop components. For example, we only support 64-bit applications. We don't provide any user space libraries other than Vulkan, Pulse Audio, and a proprietary interface for handling game things like input, online, and others. As you can imagine, porting games from Windows to Linux is not very easy. Especially for older games, it becomes more and more expensive. To help with that, our team provides developers with few options already, which we've talked about last time, which are out-of-the-box Unity and Unreal Engine integration. If your game is built using a recent supported version of one of those engines, it can be easily run and polished for Stadia. Stadia Porting Toolkit is a set of source code libraries that help translating Windows APIs to Linux. For example, we use DXVK to implement DirectX APIs, so developers don't have to modify their game renderer at all. We already have multiple partners using this toolkit, and the feedback we're getting is really encouraging. The new thing I'm going to talk about today is an approach we took to run unmodified Windows games on Stadia using something that we call binary translation. Similar to Wine and Proton on Linux, it allows you to run your Windows games on Stadia without the need of recompilation or any other platform-specific work. So how does it work? Let's go over a high-level overview of how technologies like Wine and Proton work in general. Wine is not an emulator, which means that CPU instructions are not emulated, since we are running on the same architecture. It's not entirely true for a 32 to 64-bit journey, but you'll hear about that later on. However, as you'll see, the whole operating system is emulated, or at least, as we call it, translated. Here you can see an overview of how Windows application communicates with the PC. You can see that applications use system libraries, or DLLs, to communicate with the operating system. The only important part for us here is the interface between the application and the DLLs. What those DLLs do inside and how they communicate with the Windows kernel themselves is not really relevant. We can replace the system DLLs with our own and provide all the services needed by the application by using our own implementation. So a rough plan of running a Windows game on Linux looks as follows. We start by loading a game executable from disk. It contains all the information needed to correctly load code and data segments into memory. Next, we patch the executable, so instead of loading real system DLLs, we can point to our internal implementation. Final step is to simply jump to the game code itself and the game is running. Over the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through the steps needed to create your own Windows emulator. Let's start with some basic assumptions. We will focus on 64-bit games only. X64 implementation on Windows simplifies many things and you'll be able to run newer games. Let's focus on a single process for now. This is enough to run lots of DRM-free games that don't require a launcher. Again, for simplicity, you can start with single-player games only. Getting DRM to work under emulation is tricky, especially that most of them use undocumented anti-tampering techniques that are hard to get right. Fortunately, there are enough DRM-free games out there for you to not care about this at the beginning. We start from the top. 
loading and parsing Windows executables, which are called PE in short. The PE file consists of a header and various sections. Header, as you probably expect, contains information about where things are placed in the file, while sections contain actual code and data. We need to load the sections in memory at proper offsets. We are especially interested in the import sections of a PE file, which specifies which system DLLs and functions are required for the executable to run correctly. On this slide, you can see an oversimplified view of an import section, but it should give you a basic idea. The section contains a list of individual functions that are called anywhere from the executable. Each entry contains the name of a DLL at the top here, the name of a function in the middle, and the memory address where that function is loaded by the system at the bottom. So all we have to do is provide our own function pointer instead, and the game would simply call our implementation. Now that we know where to look for required DLLs, let's just print out the list. We need a way to somehow provide valid function pointers, even though there's no real implementation on our side yet. The reason for this is that we don't want the game to simply crash in a random place, but rather we want to know which of the unimplemented functions was hit. The way we've approached this was to dump all the exports from a given DLL and use code generation to generate all the needed functions. You can use a dump bin tool that comes with Visual Studio to list all of the functions exported by a given DLL. But there are also many other programs that you could use instead. Then you can write a script to go through the list and generate C++ code. You can see an example of an automatically generated stub function. It basically just prints out its name and then crashes on the non-implemented macro. But that's enough for us. The debugger would break right here, showing us exactly what to work on next. We also maintain a simple map that matches names with the addresses. So when we load the executable, we can find the appropriate function and plug it into the import table. At this point, we've replaced all the OS functionality with stubs. When we jump to the entry point of the executable, it will just run as expected because it's the same CPU. As soon as it calls an OS function, it will break in one of the stubbed functions. Now it's just a matter of implementing this function and repeat. We found that this is a really nice way of slowly moving forward without being overwhelmed by the amount of work that has to be done. It also gives a nice feeling of progress and accomplishment. Although I have to warn you, there are hundreds of Windows functions you need to implement to launch a game, not to mention other APIs like DirectX that can be huge. But once a function is implemented, it is there for all the future games, so it will get easier the more games you get running. There are some challenges that you will face while porting Windows applications. Some of them are TLS callbacks. Those are functions put into the executable that need to be called before the entry point itself. Windows provides something called process environment block and thread environment block that are accordingly process and thread specific. Those are structs filled with different OS information. The challenging part here is that TEB can be accessed directly by using a GS CPU register, which means it cannot be trapped as easily as API functions. Instead, hitting off not implemented macro you've seen before, the game will just crash. It takes some assembly debugging techniques to figure out any issue around this. Operating systems do a lot of complicated things to unwind the call stack when an exception is thrown. Not only you have to emulate the way Windows does it, but also you have to unwind Linux stack frames when needed. This is probably one of the most complicated and hardest part to debug we've encountered so far. Good news is that there are lots of games that don't use exceptions at all, so you might just ignore it at the beginning. Depending on what your goal is, you might not want to implement everything yourself. Especially the graphics APIs are massive and require a lot of code to parse and recompile shaders, for example. Fortunately, there are some great open source projects with permissive licenses that you can very easily hook up in your project. The gold standard used by Proton for DirectX translation is DXVK. 
If your game uses X-Audio API, you can use an open source implementation called F-Audio. Those are just two examples of the resources available. Okay, so now that we have a 64-bit game running, what about older ones that are 32-bit? Stadia is 64-bit only. We don't have access to any of the 32-bit libraries. But we got an idea. What if we just parse the executable offline and convert all the code from 64-bit to 32-bit? Sounds simple, right? So the rough plan is, parse an x86 binary offline and extract all the code parts. As you'll see on the next slide, this is actually the hardest part. Next, we've taken the approach of disassembling and decompiling x86 assembly instructions back to C++ code, actually mostly C. We considered different options like LLVM IL representation, but we decided that C++ will be the easiest to read and debug. Finally, we compile everything together along with the API implementations that we built already for 64-bit games. We use a regular 64-bit compiler. Since we're doing this conversion offline, we don't even need any dynamic DLL loading and patching, so all of the code can be compiled into a single optimized binary. And there you have it, the game is running. Actually, let me walk you through some details. As I mentioned before, the hardest part here is to actually find the code in the executable. The way assembly works is that there's no clear distinction between code and data. There are entire papers written on this subject, commercial tools like IDA Pro or Ghidra that try to do those things, but as far as I know, nobody solved this problem with 100% reliability yet for all kinds of binaries. But we try anyway. Use PDBs. That's the easiest way. If you have access to debug symbols of the game, you can easily extract all the function addresses from there. We can start following the assembly from the known entry points. Call instructions are obvious. They point to existing functions. Jumps are more tricky. They might be go-tos, switches, or actual function calls, and it's not always trivial to distinguish between them. You can also look for special patterns that compilers emit at the beginning and end of functions. In general, looking for known code patterns is a good strategy. There is also a special section in the executable that contains all the addresses that have to be adjusted in case the executable gets loaded at a different address than compiled for. While this is mandatory for DLLs, executables might not have them because the OS can guarantee their load address. If you are lucky and your executable contains a relocation table, following addresses from there will show you where the code is. Now that we know where all the code blocks are, we need to disassemble them. While writing a disassembler is an interesting challenge on its own, there are multiple open source solutions for the job to pick from, just to name a few here. Once you disassemble the code, it's pretty trivial to convert it to a simple C++ code looking something like this. As you can see, it's very low level and is basically a one-to-one -one translation from the assembler. While this approach generates megabytes of code, the idea here is that the C++ compiler will do a good job optimizing the code and produce actually a sane binary. Because DLL implementations we've written so far expect x64 calling convention, we need to write some wrappers that will get parameters from the 32-bit stack, potentially convert them, and pass to the 64-bit code. Here you can see some pseudocode. Our actual implementation is very template-heavy, and in turn, it's not really presentable. Let me walk you through it. We get an emulated CPU state as the input argument, 32-bit calling convention keeps arguments on the stack, so we pop appropriate 4-byte value here. Then, we pass this value as a legitimate argument to the original 64-bit implementation, and we get a 64-bit return value from it. Since we need to return to a 32-bit world, we need to adjust the return value. There are some tricks you could do with pointers, but you can also try to get away with keeping a giant map. As you can imagine, there are some nitty-gritty details that you need to solve, some of them being 32-bit games use the FPU coprocessor for the floating-point operations, 
which needs to be decompiled and emulated in addition to regular x86 code. 32-bit Windows has a totally different way of handling exceptions, which needs to be emulated. Again, many of the games don't use exceptions at all, so you might just get away with it. A 32-bit game would assume that all memory is mapped in the 4 GB address space. This won't be the case by default in your 64-bit code, so you either have to maintain some kind of translation or make sure you enforce allocating memory in a desired range. As part of the 32-bit CPU emulation, a separate stack has to be maintained. It's especially important when implementing exception handling because then two stacks have to be unwinded. So how did we do? We were able to run 32-bit AAA titles with 60 FPS performance on a pure 64-bit Stadia operating system. Because all the conversion and OS patching is being done offline, the result is a regular compiled ELF binary with all the symbols. If you have PDBs for the original game, you can use them to name the actual game functions and then have proper call stacks when debugging and profiling. Because there is no way to always tell from the offline analysis where the code would jump, we need to maintain a map of 32 to 64-bit addresses, which needs to be searched for every jump. This hurts performance, in particular when there's lots of virtual function calls. We've seen even four times performance decrease in some specific game areas because of this. While the offline conversion worked well for a few games, we've started seeing more and more games that had relocation tables stripped, which basically prevented us from reliably discovering code segments inside the executable. At the same time, Apple announced their Rosetta 2 technology, which is able to convert x64 to ARM64 code on the fly. We thought, well, that's amazing. Let's do something like this. The idea is, we're going to process the game at runtime, so we know exactly which code path to take. We don't have to know where the code segments are anymore. The running game will simply show us. Once the game jumps to a code segment, we disassemble it and generate new x64 code on the fly and then jump to it. Think of it as putting a breakpoint at every single jump instruction. When it hits, we disassemble the x86 code and we generate x64 instructions directly. Because x64 is basically a superset of x86, most of the conversion is pretty straightforward. After the block is ready, we jump there and allow the game to continue. This is a pretty straightforward optimization. We don't have to convert the same blocks over and over again. The idea is that after initial few seconds of hitching, the game will play smoothly just reusing already converted code. Our code for runtime instruction translation has more than 4,000 lines of code, so it's hard to show in here. But here's some pseudocode as an example. As you can see, it's basically a simple loop going through x86 assembly instructions one at a time. Whenever an instruction needs to access the memory, it might need to be adjusted, which is what the process instruction function does. Most work is being done for jumps and function calls. At the end of the loop, we assemble the instruction again, this time using x64 assembler and append it to the end of the generated block. When the whole block is processed, we directly jump to the first instruction of the converted block. How did it go? We don't need to know where the code is anymore. No need for relocation tables. All executables are supported. For the games we tested, there was no visible difference between the previous offline solution and the runtime one. This is an obvious drawback. The cache needs to be built and maintained per each game. Time for a summary. Even though the technology is complex, it didn't require a big team to develop some good results. While software like Wine is more than 20 years old and hundreds of people work on it on a daily basis, it's still possible to get some games running relatively quickly. While we've proven that games could be successfully run using this technology and performance is very good, it still requires a significant amount of effort per game to make it work. This is obviously where the 20 years of development comes in.
We adopted our runtime 32-bit conversion to work with Wine and Proton to be able to test more games. Results are very good, and this is definitely one of the paths that we consider moving forward when thinking about 32-bit game support on Stadia. The question you might have been asking yourselves during this presentation is why did they even bother to write such a technology themselves rather than use well-known and battle-tested solutions like Wine and Proton? Well, as I said at the beginning, Stadia uses a very stripped-down version of Linux. Basically, you can only depend on libc, pthread, and some other core libraries, while Wine requires lots of external dependencies to even build. Stadia is built using custom hardware, with custom drivers and Vulkan extensions. We also don't have to care about multiple windows, alt-tabbing, multitasking, and other things that desktop applications have to support. This allows us to optimize game-specific paths. We also don't need most of the things that Desktop Wine has to support, like GUI, ActiveX, browsers, etc. We can make assumptions and optimizations that wouldn't be possible otherwise. If anyone tried to debug anything under Wine, they know what this means. We, as game developers, are used to using Visual Studio, where code completion just works, you can hit F5 to build and debug your code, and when it crashes, you see exactly where and why. Our technology works on Windows, Linux, and Stadia, which allows us to quickly debug and compare across platforms to solve hard problems. And last but not least, creating new things and solving hard problems is fun. Writing this technology from scratch allowed myself and the team to learn how binary translation works. With this knowledge, we are much better equipped to understand and potentially contribute to other similar projects if needed. Let me give a huge shout out and thanks to Andrew and Greg who work with me on this project and to Christian who invented and implemented most of the 32-bit stuff. It's amazing how much a small, skilled team can achieve in a short amount of time. And with that, thank you so much for listening to my presentation and I wish you best of luck in your own experiments. Bye.